Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about here is a very serious terrorist threat. And this is what security services are ultimately very concerned about. Right, a January 6th style event. In this case, it seems perhaps even...
We are returning to our evening session for December 13th, 2022. Uh, the board uh, held its regular open session uh, beginning at 3 o'clock today, and after 3 o'clock, we had a uh, lengthy work session trying to address some issues and some problems and some staffing problems for our Department of Social Services. But we are resuming our meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, the next item on our agenda, item L, L1, that was a petition of Panda Storage Rentals and Sales to obtain a special use permit for equipment sales and rentals and a special use permit for many warehouses on approximately 4.82 acres of land, zone C2, high intensity commercial district, located at the 5300 block of West Main Street and the 5400 block of Pleasant Run Drive in Catawba. Uh, that public hearing has been postponed until January 10th, 2023. Now, the second item on our agenda, item L2, that is a petition of Barnett Properties, LLC, to rezone approximately 9.38 acres from R3C, medium density multifamily residential district with conditions, R1, low density residential district, I1C, low intensity industrial district with conditions, C2C, high intensity commercial district with conditions, and C1, low intensity commercial district, two, C2C, high intensity commercial district with conditions for retail sales located in the 4400 block of Brambleton Avenue, including 4449, and 4457 Brambleton Avenue, and the 4500 and 4600 blocks of Old Cave Spring Road. And all of this is located in the Windsor Hills Magisterial District. Mr. Thompson. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, so the rezoning you have before you, 11 parcels, five different zonings, um, conditions on seven parcels, from previous rezonings from 1980 and 1985. So the intent is to rezone all to C2 for retail sales. Uh, quick location, here are the parcels uh, located off of Brambleton Avenue and Old, Street, Old Cave Spring Road, across the street from uh, Cotton Hill Road, or Colonial Hill Road, Colonial Avenue, excuse me, um, across from Kroger and Bojangles, um, again, as you mentioned, it's the 4400 block of Bramlett Avenue and the 4500 and 4600 blocks of Old Cave Spring Road, uh, 9.38 acres. Currently on the property, there are two single family residences and nine of the parcels are vacant and they are proposing retail sales use. A couple of photos. Um, so they are, there's two existing entrances uh, to the property. This entrance gives access to the residential houses. Uh, and they, this one of the entrances that will be modified for the proposed retail sales. So it's looking back, uh, going up the driveway from Brambleton Avenue. Uh, this is a vantage point up the driveway, looking back towards uh, Brambleton Avenue. You can see Bojangles across the street. Um, property is generally um, it's open and wooded and has uh, wooded buffers along the property lines as well. Um, as you can see, some of this where it's open <laughs> and along the property lines, you do have uh, vegetation. Um, the other entrance, which I think all of you are familiar with, was used by VDOT for many years for their maintenance operations, um, snow removal, um, and the other operations they would do for uh, maintaining our roadways. Um, so that's just that lot. And again, looking back across the street where you can see the fueling station and then also uh, Kroger in the background. And then the intersection at, uh, on Old Cave Spring Road. Um, one of the things you'll see on the, the concept plan is they are lengthening uh, both the through and the turn lane there at Old Cave Spring uh, Lane to allow more storage, but we'll talk about that also a little bit later. So uh, retail sales, the sale of rental, uh, the sale or rental with incidental service of commonly used goods and merchandise is for personal or household use, but excludes those things that are more specifically listed in our zoning ordinance. Uh, obviously, it's not permitted uh, in the R3 or R1. Uh, it's a 
special use in the C1 and it is allowed in I1 and C2. So the intent is to clean up the entire site, zone it to C2 where it be a permitted use. Existing proper conditions, again from 1980, 1985 would be removed as part of the zoning action. Uh, concept plan, the original concept plan, we'll talk about the revised one here in a second. Uh, retail sales building, uh, 48,841 square feet. Uh, shows a pro proposed drive-through uh, on the eastern uh, side of the building. 244 parking spaces. They will provide access both from Old Cape Spring Road and Brambleton, modifying those existing entrances that exist today. Uh, they show a stormwater management facility on the Old Cape Spring Road side near the property um, nearest Old Cape Spring Road. Uh, they are showing landscape buffers, uh, which are required when you have C2 next to R1. Uh, they also have sidewalks uh, proposed along uh, the access roads, but also along Old Cave Spring Road. And obviously, uh, they need some retaining walls to balance the site as well. Kind of show, this is also what's in your packet, part of the concept plan. Um, let me go back here. So um, on this diagram, there is two cross-section lines. Uh, section A goes from Old Cave Spring uh, Road to the residential subdivision on the eastern side of the property. And then Section B goes from Brambleton Avenue through the building to uh, the back property, uh, to the northern property. So with those, um, the first one, the top diagram shows what the cut and fill um, the dashed line is the existing grade. Uh, what they're showing is the proposed uh, cut and fill uh, on the site. Again, so you have on the top photo, Old Cane Spring Road is to the right-hand side of the diagram. Uh, as you go up, you see the access drive, and then they will cut a notch in, in the topography for the building uh, pad and the parking uh, retaining wall uh, beyond that. And then as you notice, the residential subdivision to the eastern side sits higher than where the building is. The bottom diagram, Brownton Avenue is on the left-hand side, uh, going back towards the back of the property line. You can see where, again, they're still cutting to put in uh, the building, uh, so it will sit a little lower than the current elevations that are on the site. Uh, this was also in your packet. Um, this is kind of showing uh, the improvements uh, both to Brambleton Avenue and to Old Cave Spring Road. Um, so the entrance off of uh, Brambleton Avenue is uh, right in, right out. But they also have a little bit of a turn lane um, on the property to go into that right in, right out. On uh, Old Cave Spring Road, like I mentioned earlier, they're lengthening the left turn uh, lane and the through. Um, and you can see where their entrance is lining up with uh, the Kroger fuel station, and it tapers back and having a turn lane that would turn into the site. The other thing they show is a 75-foot uh, left turn lane into that entrance as well. So reconfiguration and extension of those roadway, of that roadway to make those improvements. Uh, existing zoning, as I mentioned, uh, uh, five different zoning categories with different conditions. Uh, Surrounding zoning to the north is R1, to the east is C2, to the west is R1, and to the south is R1 and C2C. So some commercial development adjacent to it, but also as well R1. Uh, the future land use uh, plan both is transition and neighborhood conservation. So uh, transition uh, is a future land use area that encourages the orderly development of highway frontage parcels, generally serves as a developed buffer between highways and nearby adjacent lower intensity development. Re intense retail and highway ordering commercial uses are discouraged. So again, this proposal is not consistent with that transition future land use designation. Uh, neighborhood conservation, as many of you are aware, is a future land use where you try to maintain the existing development pattern and establish single family neighborhoods. Um, and so they're trying to encourage that existing development pattern. Again, uh, the, the proposed rezoning is not consistent with that neighborhood conservation uh, future land use designation. Planning Commission, uh, they held a public hearing uh, November 1st, uh, so a little more than a month ago. Had 11 citizens speak during uh, the public hearing, raised a lot of different concerns. 
A uh, lot of concerns with buffers, both the buffer width, the height of the fencing, uh, lighting was an issue raised, traffic, traffic safety, um, you know, a lot of comments about traffic, uh, stormwater management, uh, the proximity of the development to neighboring residences. Uh, at that point, there were no profits submitted with the application. Concerns about noise and the operation of that um, retail use. Um, amount of parking for this use type. We thought there was more parking than was needed. Uh, question about property values, uh, the height of the proposed building, and uh, comments about the close proximity to existing grocery store and the need. Is there a need for uh, another grocery store? So, uh, planning commissioners uh, closed the public hearing, discussed those issues that were raised. Um, they had certain concerns they wanted to address um, and wanted to see if the applicant was willing to go back and address those issues. One dealt with, you know, there was no proffer dealing with conformance to the concept plan. Um, there was concerns about um, the location of the uh, retail use building, especially on the northern property line. Um, and see if there was a way that, to increase that buffer. And then they talked to, also talked uh, requests a conversation about hours of operation and if there would be profits associated with that. Uh, they postponed action until their December 6th meeting. Uh, the applicant has submitted a revised concept plan and signed a proffer statement. So the revised concept plan, uh, what they did was they increased the buffer. Uh, so the access points, generally located the same place parking some of the parking got rearranged um, but they have a 40-foot buffer instead of a 30-foot buffer um, and they also increased the um, screening you know, so you're required to have a six-foot fence screened fence and they have on their concept plan show an eight-foot screening along not only the northern property line but also the eastern and the a little bit of the southern so wherever r1 abuts the property they should, they're showing a 40-foot buffer, a landscape buffer, and we'll have an eight-foot uh, fence uh, on that proper, on, as part of that buffer. Really didn't change the dynamics. It shows the increased buffer width on these um, cross-section drawings. Submitted proffers uh, that went along with that revised uh, concept plan is that the site will be developed in substantial conformance with the concept plan prepared by Lumsden Associates dated August 30th, 2022 and revised November 30th, 2022, subject to any changes required during the conference of site plan review process. And then hours of operation open to the public shall be no earlier than 6 a.m. and no later than 12 a.m. each day. So on December 6th, the planning commission voted to recommend approval of the rezoning request with those two proper conditions. With that, I'll take any questions you may have. Board member, have any questions? Mr. Radford. Yeah. Right. Philip, um, what's uh, hours of operation mean? So it's just when they're open to the public. Um, there was some conversation about, you know, would that involve, you know, some stores will restock at night so it wouldn't, prohibit that from happening, but the store would not be open to the public. Okay. So how about dumpsters coming at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning and dumping stuff? Has, how is that being handled? I will let the applicant address that. Okay. I think they can speak about the operations of the, the, the intended user of the property. Okay. And I think they'll address that. Okay. I think it's not, I think what they're going to say is that's not their, you know, they'll work around that and do it during the hours of operation, but I'll let them speak to that. Okay. And you talked about the, the parking, the, there's a lot, there's more parking than what's required. Did we require that or did the applicant do that? Applicant typically. Okay. Um, so there, you know, there's certain, and this is no different than at, for example, Tanglewood Mall, right? Our requirement is a lot less than what a retailer will want to have, right? Mm -hmm. um, for their, um, for their lease or for what they require as part of them to be able to develop. Um, they have a certain criteria of so much park spaces per thousand square feet. Typically, it's higher than what the county requires. Okay. And then uh, where they added the additional storage, how many vehicles does that add? 
I'll you let know. them speak to that. Okay. They have a better length of what that does as far as, uh, and they have their traffic engineer who's here as well, as, okay. as well as Lumsden Associate, if you have any questions about the concept plan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, do we have a representative of the petitioner here? And yes. Would um, he or she like to speak? Also, if you have other any questions for VDOT, uh, we do have a VDOT Thank representative you. here as well. Good evening. Um, I'm Alan Manus with Barnett Properties. Uh, we're based in Henderson, North Carolina, with offices in Raleigh, North Carolina also. With me here tonight is Hall Barnett, president of our company. Um, our traffic engineer, Larry Green, with Weatherill Engineering. And, and Andrew Lumsden with Lumsden Associates here in Roanoke. This is a look at the property subject to this petition. We have 11 parcels totaling, totaling 9.38 acres and as you can tell by the way you read that into the record it's a mixed bag of zoning currently um, there are two existing residents that have lived on the property for more than 40 years so you can see the, the two houses at the top of the driveway there and then also the DOT property is as was mentioned by Mr. Thompson um, there the site drains generally for th this plan is oriented with north to the right of the sheet. So the site drains generally from west to east with runoff entering Ludlick Creek at the northeast corner of the site with around 90 feet of fall across the site. This is the revised concept plan that was a result of uh, the planning commission hearing. We went back and worked with the tenant to arrive at the 40 foot buffer um, it, it took some massaging in the site, but we think we can make that work. Um, as you'll see, there are the full access driveway will be on Old Cave Spring Road with the right-in, right-out driveway to Bramble and Ave Avenue. The, uh, the grading will require some significant retaining walls to accommodate this, both on the cut side and the fill side. And it's... Uh, as we said, a fairly steep topography is, is fairly typical of this area. Um, in addition to the 40-foot landscape buffers, which exceed the 30 feet required by the ordinance, we are offering the 8-foot screening fence against all residential properties, which exceeds the 6-foot requirement. Um, site lighting will meet your ordinance as well and use cutoff type fixtures to eliminate glare to the sides to really force the light down onto the parking area which is the intent the two cross sections which you've already seen once again i won't uh, <laughs> go too long on these other than say really from the west coming down to the store it sits well below those neighboring properties in that direction and any any light poles would be uh, of the type that would cast that light down not up or sideways We'll let Larry talk about some of the findings from the traffic, his traffic study. Wow. Thank you, Alan. Again, uh, prior to our study, we uh, consulted VDOT and Roanoke County to determine what intersections we might study uh, to analyze the impact of the proposed development. And uh, we came up with, well, VDOT, in, in consultation with VDOT, we came up with six intersections that we would study one particular finding that we noted that at US 221 and Old Cave Spring Road, we did find uh, a poor level of service uh, during the Saturday uh, peak hour, um, uh, a level of service E, but when we uh, uh, analyzed that intersection, we came up with an improvement to basically lengthen the right turn lane from Brambleton Avenue all the way back to our site 
which uh, uh, helped the queuing significantly and actually improved the level of service down to an acceptable level of service D uh, operations. Um, in addition, we uh, striped a 75-foot inbound left turn lane on Old Cave Spring uh, Road to accommodate traffic uh, coming from that direction. Uh, the next thing I would show you are conceptual elevations of what the building might look like. Um, let's say these are conceptual and subject to be modified as we move through the process, but the important features would be it's predominantly brick building on all sides and a, using a mixture of materials and, and some articulation of the building to give it some relief and some in architectural interest as well. So in conclusion, a few things to note. Um, per your ordinance, C2 is intended for major arterial roads, and anyone that's driven Brambleton, I think, would agree that it would meet that test. Um, we're, by this request, downzoning a portion of the property from industrial to commercial, um, not to mention that current residents have lived beside an industrially zoned site for decades now. This would clean up some of that incongruity um, one measure of the intensity of development is floor area ratios, the ratio of your square footage of floor to the square footage of your property. Our proposal would be a low FAR of only 0.12 or 12 percent. That's uh, half or less of many of the other commercial properties along Brambleton that have significantly higher FARs. It's a uh, more consistent with the small scale planned and clustered retail that's discussed in the transition area. There would be minimal impact to public infrastructure and, and less than a multifamily proposal would have on this site. Minimal impact to public safety and once again less than a multifamily proposal would have. Uh, the roadway improvements will fully mitigate the traffic and in some respects, as Larry mentioned, improve it over what it is today. With that, we appreciate your consideration and are happy to take any questions. Mr. Radford. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll ask the questions that Mr. Thompson didn't answer. Uh, so why, why so much more parking than above, above the standard? Um, absolutely a requirement of the tenant. Tenant, okay. We would um, not necessarily want that much, but as it's, the question has been asked and answered, they, they must have it. Okay. Especially with a standalone store where there's no other businesses to share parking with, that ratio is important to them. Uh, uh, are they planning to co lease in that building or are they going to be the only tenant? No, it'll be a single tenant. Single. Building. Okay, all right. Uh, so, <clears throat> back to the traffic guy, uh, you, you put in the uh, extra length. How much stacking do we pick up on that intersection? How many cars, number of cars, did y'all? Um, Five, ten, you're talking, you're talking about from 221 back to our driveway? Correct. To your um, entrance, yeah, on Old, old Case Spring Lane. I think we can accommodate about 20 vehicles in that, um, which is significantly longer than what we can today. 20, 20 more or a total of 20? About 20 total, yes. 20, okay. That's it's just in that right turn lane. The right turn lane, okay. Yes. All right, so we've got three lanes there. Yes. Okay, you got the turn left, you got the straight going through and the right. Yes. Okay. Yes, and that was that's really the problem currently is that there's the, the right turn demand to go south on 221 is great. And what happens is because of that short right turn lane now it spills into the through lane and it actually attends at certain times queues back, which would be beyond our driveway now. But when we even with building our project when we lengthen that right turn lane all the way back to our driveway, that cle cleans up the queue, and the queue actually doesn't reach the driveway where we're, we're proposing. So, it, And that's why the level of service dropped from an E to an acceptable level of service D. Okay. So, and, and the right in, right out driveway to Brambleton will give right. our traffic right. a means to not even go Correct. through that intersection. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm reading some notes that I got some, from some citizens. Uh, one says that the traffic study, there was no traffic study between the intersection of Cave Spring Lane and Old K 
Cave Spring Road. Is that information you got from VDOT or? or um, so sorry, you well, back up, you got to back up to get to that intersection. Yes, um, well that, when we scoped our study, VDOT did not deem that as a critical intersection to analyze, so we did not analyze that particular intersection. Okay. So VDOT was the? Yes. Okay, all righty. Um, that's all I got on track, but just a, a couple more questions. Uh, the, the fence, you're gonna, eight foot fence, what's your material gonna be on that? Um, I'm looking be, for maintenance. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes into it. We'll own it and maintain it. it the intention is a privacy fence, opaque, um, okay. that you, a physical and a visual barrier. Okay. So it'd be 100% opaque, whether that's wood or vinyl or. Okay. You know. Right. So uh, also ask earlier, um, uh, what's your, what's your, what's the tenant's policy going to be on dumping dumpsters? The tenant will contract with waste management just like every other business uh -huh. here. Um, it's hard to control waste management or place a condition upon waste management. They would communicate to them that they would prefer it during the day, but I believe your noise ordinance would come into play there also if they were doing it at the wrong hours. Okay. Um, would think the county ordinance would apply to them as anywhere else. Okay. So a question to my attorney, our Peter. Yes, sir. Uh, noise ordinance, 7 a.m., correct? 7 a.m. till 10 p.m.? <clears throat> Generally, that is the, <clears throat> the hours for the noise ordinance. I will, I'll pull that up right now as we're speaking just to verify that that specifically applies to this situation. I'll uh, have okay. the answer momentarily. All right. All right. Appreciate it. And the tenant would communicate that to the hauler, but I'm, I'm sure waste management's aware of that probably since they're already serving the area. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. That's all I have for right now. Mr. Norton. <clears throat> Question on the lighting. In the neighborhood I live in, there are some citizens... Uh, complained about lighting on an adjacent retail business and they changed the lighting they put in uh, and Mr. Kingwood you might want to add to this they put in some uh, lighting that didn't show so much glare they put like the deflectors that's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say on the lights mm -hmm. uh, two questions how high are these light poles going to be are they going to be higher than the, the uh, buffer fence and secondly, uh, are they going to have deflectors on them? We would plan to use cutoff shields is the, the term, yes, with the, the way it helps to cast that light down. It'd be a shoebox type fixture that only shines down, does not shine up. Um, pole height, I mean, when you get into design, pole heights vary anywhere from 25 <laughs> to 30 feet typically. It becomes a, a you, you're the shorter the poles, the more poles you're going to have to get the adequate light level. So 30 feet is a typical. So the fence is going to be, what, 40 eight, feet? Eight, well, a 40-foot wide buffer with an 8-foot fence. Okay, so as you're the cross, have, you're I mean, have, as the cross-section showed you, um, they would not be taller than, they would not be up to the level of the residences to the west. So and that's, that's where the parking field really is. At the back of the store, they wouldn't need to be as tall. Uh, that's not the real parking field. All right, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I have uh, found applicable provisions of the noise ordinance. And uh, to answer Mr. Radford's question, there are two provisions of the noise ordinance that would Could be... Could use the microphone, please? Uh, yes, of course, sir. There would be two provisions of the noise ordinance that would potentially apply. Uh, the first is the loading or unloading of trucks outdoors within 100 yards of a residential dwelling between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. the following day. That, could be a viol that would be a violation. Mm -hmm. The second is the operation of a trash collection vehicle mm -hmm. between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. in such a manner as to be plainly audible at any residence 100 or more yards away. Mm -hmm. I think that covers it. <laughs> Sounds like waste management uh, has got to listen to our ordinance. Uh, I'm sure they've been told that before. Okay. Uh, it might be good to, to remind them of that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Traffic Person, uh, <laughs> uh, 
talk, I want to follow up, and maybe I didn't understand Mr. Radford's question about queuing. If I am driving from 221, from Brambleton, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the left-hand turn, that I guess what I would call the main entrance in and out, uh, when I looked at the concept plan, it had a 75-foot distance. Yes. Um, is the 75-foot distance the length of the left turn lane? It is the length of the storage lane. Now, okay. so keep in mind, and again, that holds about three, three vehicles or so. Um, we're, we're anticipating that most of the traffic coming from 221 would actually choose to use the right-in, right-out access on 221 to access the site. There could be people coming in um, on Old Cave Spring Road as well, but um, when we did our queuing analysis, 75 feet was all that's required. However, if more, if more stacking is, need, is needed, it's going to be basically a back-to-back -back left turn lane so that some of those vehicles could spill into the opposing left turn lane to, to service 221. It's, it's so your hope is more people will use the right in, right out off of Brambleton uh, and that the other traffic load will be coming from the other direction on Old Cave Spring to make the right turn in. That, that's, the, that's the hope. Yes, okay. but okay. again, if, that, if the queuing is not enough, we're not going to prevent more than three vehicles to do that. But Thank yes. you. I've got a follow-up question then. Um, so if you're coming uh, east on Brambleton and you're going to turn left on the old K Spring Road and you're going to go left, because that's where a lot of your traffic is going to come from, because everybody lives that, in direct, that direction. A lot of them do. Uh, so there's not a separate left-hand lane to turn. I'm sorry, to turn left into the site you're talking about? Correct. That there's... there's Oh, okay. No. Um, he's talking about coming from are, this. Are you talking about another turn lane on Brambleton or at our entrance from Old Cave Spring? The entrance at Old Cave Spring Road, where you'll turn, you'll turn left into the site. You're right there at the entrance of the Kroger Gas. There, yes, you, yes, we are. There's provided. nothing. Is there anything there to stack, or is that the 75 feet? That's you're the talking 75 about? feet. Yes. There, yeah, there is a ded dedicated left turn. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. That's that's. It's hard to see on this, uh, it, it is, it is yeah. this drawing here, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I couldn't. Could okay. you, could you put the whatever slide number it is that has the concept plan, so that people can see it? And, I, and I'm yeah, I'm assuming it. that many of the citizens will probably want to refer to the concept plan, either that or. Is that yeah. the presentation or for? No, you see where I was talking, plan. David? I see it. I yep. guess yep. I was concerned because if I'm coming from where I live in Cave Spring, right. I'm coming down Colonial, I'm crossing over Brambleton, mm -hmm. and I'd probably keep on going straight through the intersection, and then I'd want to make a left turn, like across from the Kroger fueling station. And if you have 75 feet, um, I, I was figuring you might fit five cars. In 75, I don't know, I'm guessing it's, how long a car I mean, is. But it, my, my point is you're going to back up and you might be blocking the through traffic. Um, well, you could actually go into a little bit of the opposing, opposing left turn lane, so you wouldn't be blocking the through traffic. I understand. But it's our hope that a fair amount of people would, if you're coming across Colonia, would choose to turn left and then they right right into the site. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure I'll make many people mad in the audience because since I live in Cave Spring, I tend to use that as a cut through to get the 419. I, I don't go immediately up Chaparral and make the left. I, I use that as sort of the back way around. Uh, I don't think that's a secret call. Well, no, I understand. I just, yeah. <laughs> and so I can see a lot of traffic coming, you know, as you're coming down Colonial and you cross over. Um, that, that is a heavily trafficked uh, intersection. It sure is. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, Mr. Radford, I know you had some VDOT questions. Would you want to ask uh, the VDOT folks to speak, or would you rather I go into the public hearing? Yeah, go into the public hearing. I've 
I, I'm going to hold on the meeting okay. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we may call you back up because we may have some questions later. Um, I would like to open the public hearing. Um, I'd like to remind the speakers to please state your name and your address and try to speak into the microphones at the podium. And so you have to, if you have to pull them down a little bit so that everybody can hear, that would be good. Um, you have three minutes. We have uh, 18 speakers. So uh, what will happen is I'll probably take a break sometime <laughs> in the middle of that time. <laughs> so uh, let's start with the first speaker. Speaker number one is uh, uh, KC Hawag. Yes. yes, sir. Is that close? Oh, yes, yes, right. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, this, can you put this on the screen? Let me see which one that yes. is. That's the same plan. Yes, because this is the, I need something. The same plan, the county, I know. Philip, where's Philip? Is that in your presentation? It is on. I think that's slide 19, Philip. I did. You want the exist the original, right? The original uh, one, not the revised. Yeah, one. Th this one doesn't matter. I right. just need to show us. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. My name is Casey Wong. I'm the majority owner and HOA manager of Bomberton Common, 4515, 4525 Bomberton Avenue. That was just one uh, beside right here. Okay. Uh, this is the one. I'm very concerned about 18 small business in the Bomberton Common, in Group 4 Medical Office. They take care of more than 100 patients daily. They all depend on only one entrance, only one entrance. The new development proposed their second entrance and exit at the Bomberton Avenue will prevent the car exit from the Bomberton Common complex in normal traffic. Car exit from the Bomberton Common had to wait for the traffic light break for other cars' mercy. In the new development, put second exit in the Bomberton Avenue. They will be first get into the Bomberton Avenue. Car from the Bomberton Common will never get a chance to exit. It will choke the 18 small business. Even majority member feel need to pass the rezoning request. I'm here respectfully asking all honorable members to make a small change on the rezoning request and give the 18 small business in Bomber the Common a chance to survive. By making the new development second entrance and exit at a Bomberton Avenue, enter only, enter only. Since they have the main entrance at a SN, at a all case swing row already. Also, if it is agreeable, the traffic light at an all case swing row in a Bumperton Avenue will regulate the car except for the new development to the Bumperton Avenue. This will help a lot of traffic coming from the Bumperton North and Colonial Avenue. So please give us a chance to survive. And I'm thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. the, next, uh, the next speaker, uh, we have a request. Uh, this speaker was unable to be here.
but I believe she has asked the clerk to read her letter uh, into the record, um, and that's our next speaker. Um, Joanne Mylon Holly of 5206 Bradford Circle, um, previously of 7652 Wineberry Trail. Uh, I have been a resident of Runnett County for almost 30 years. For most of this time, I was working at the Veterans Affair Medical Center in Salem. As such, I travel daily through the intersection at which this construction is proposed. Over those 28 working years, I have watched the congestion at that intersection has steadily increased as more residential areas were developed. In the evening commute time, the line of waiting cars can reach back quite a way on Old Cave Spring Road toward McVitie Road. In 2021, a year after my retirement, I moved off Mason's Knob and I'm now located only 0.5 miles from the intersection of Old Cave Spring, Bramilton, and Colonial Avenues. Since my main egress is through the intersection being considered, I have found that area is, <clears throat> excuse me, is congested often during the day in addition to working commute times. I feel that the addition of another large grocery store in that particular location will contribute to the probability of increased traffic accidents at an already congested and highly traveled intersection. Secondly, I question the need for another supermarket across the street from a current Kroger store, 0.8 miles from another Kroger store, and 2.4 miles from a food line on Electric Road. Surely there are other areas of the county with a lesser density of grocery shopping choices that might be a better location choice. Thank you. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Mr. Scaff. You're next. <laughs> William Scaff, uh, member, board of directors, Farmington Place Homeowners Association, LLC, 4815, Farmington Place Court, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018, Farmington Place Homeowners Association, Oral Comment, Part 1, Zoning and Future Land Use Designations. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Farmington Place Homeowners Association respectfully requests that the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors not approve the rezoning application submitted by Barnett Properties for the construction of a grocery store at Brampton Avenue and Old Case Spring Road. The Barnett Properties grocery store project is forcing commercial development into a predominantly residential area and onto residential land. Over two-thirds of the proposed project's land is zoned residential. Using a few small parcels zoned commercial and industrial, as an excuse to rezone all of this land commercial simply compounds the original rezoning mistakes. The Roanoke County government has repeatedly said that the county very much needs more housing, particularly along the 419 corridor, and that land zone residential is becoming increasingly scarce. Thus, the highest and best use for this land actually is residential, as most of it is currently zoned, not commercial. This project runs counter to the county's development priorities and will be taking away land that could fulfill them. In fact, according to the Roanoke County Comprehensive Plan, future land use designations, about two-thirds of the land where the proposed grocery store will be located is designated transition. The remaining one-third is designated residential conservation. Thus, future development on this land is supposed to be residential. The planning department finds that, quote, the proposed retail sales use is not consistent, unquote, with either of these residential development designations. During the recent spate of residential building in Roanoke County due to high demand and low interest rates, a residential development would likely have been built on the proposed grocery store land too, and probably long before that. But the VDOT properties, including the depot, active since the late 1980s, at the corner of Brambleton Avenue and Old Cave Spring Road were necessary for ingress and egress to any residential development. VDOT would not sell the land until February 2021 to Roanoke County when the land should have been rezoned to residential in order to conform with future land use designations 
in the Roanoke County Comprehensive Plan. Did the Roanoke County government give residential developers an opportunity to purchase this property? More recently, the proposed grocery store land has been locked up since 2016 through contingency sales contracts executed by Barnett and letters of agreement from its predecessor representing the grocery store company with the owners. All the while, residential developments proceed in this area. One typical example of a single-family housing development is the preserve at Mason Knob. Another grocery store in this area is not only disruptive to a residential area, but is redundant as well. Brambleton Kroger is across the street. K Spring Corners Kroger is three minutes away. Food Lion at Grandin Road, eight minutes away, is actually closer to the residential neighborhoods <coughs> to the north and west that Barnett states are its primary customer base for the proposed grocery store. Thus, the Economic Development Department's formulaic assessment that the Barnett project, quote, will enhance commercial diversity while providing new retail shopping opportunities for residents, unquote, defies reality. There is simply no need for it. There are many areas elsewhere in the county that really do need a grocery store where this kind of development would truly create value for the community. But the Barnett business plan is unabashedly parasitic. Locate across the street from an established grocery store and pilfer from their earned customer base in an already diverse, competitive, adequately served market. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is uh, Gerald Betters. Gerald Betters, President, Farmington Place Homeowners Association, 4821 Farmington Place Court, Roanoke, uh, Farmington Place Homeowners Association, Oral Comment, Part 2. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. Old Cave Spring Road is a two-lane county road, appropriate for residential neighborhood traffic, but not designed for commercial traffic. Traffic that will accumulate at the vicinity of the grocery store cannot be accommodated by Old Cave Spring Road and will block its immediate intersections. Queues and stacking extend from Brambleton Avenue to McVitie Road and toward 419 now. They develop early in the morning, subside, then are at their worst late afternoon, precisely the times people grocery shop. It is not credible that the remedial measures for elongating the left and right turn lanes at Brambleton will alleviate the increase in congestion from the grocery store when it is unlikely to alleviate the traffic problem now. The Weatherill Engineering Traffic Impact Analysis is inadequate and incomplete, rendering its projections inaccurate and proposed remedial measures unproven. First, the Weatherill analysis omits the study uh, intersection of Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane. This collector road will convey most of the customers north and west designated by Barnett as the grocery store's primary customer base. Second, the Weatherill study was conducted in February, the severest winter month when traffic volume would be <clears throat> less. At the Planning Commission hearing, Weatherill said that it met with VDOT and Roanoke County officials, and they decided that the Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane, quotes, is not a major enough, that is, not deemed a critical intersection for the fruition of this property. Further, VDOT said that we gave them our concurrence in the traffic study. These statements by Weatherill and VDOT are contrary to the Roanoke County Police Department's speed study of Cave Spring Lane, eastbound at the intersection of Old Cave Spring Road, conducted in January 2020, seasonably comparable. This study finds that Cave Spring Lane actually supplies Old Cave Spring Road with two and a half times as much traffic late afternoon and 68% more traffic morning. So two things appear to be true. The intersection of Cave Spring Lane and Old Cave Spring Road is actually more critical to the traffic impact analysis than McVitie Road and two, the actual typical numbers are higher 
than the numbers reported in the Witherill study, that the actual traffic impacts are significantly underrepresented. Moreover, driver behavior is deteriorating uh, dangerously on K Spring Lane from 2020 to 2022. The county police studies uh, higher traffic volumes generated by grocery store inevitably result in significantly more violations. In the end, police enforcement can only focus on speeding and stop sign observance. Such enforcement is not designed to reduce traffic volume. Thus, it will have no effect on the sheer number of cars traveling Old Spring Road. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Next speaker is Jill Betters. Good evening. I'm Jill Betters, member of the Farmington Place Homeowners Association, 4821 Farmington Place Court, Roanoke, Virginia. Oral comment part three from our association. The Barnett Grocery Store will eliminate this rustic residential area and have an adverse impact on the quality of life for our surrounding residences, in addition to the traffic congestion we've spoken of. The grocery store itself will generate noise around the clock, large after-hour delivery trucks, the forklifts, the track collection, and compacting, and some litter blown about. At present, we at Farmington Place residents see the bright lights from Kroger CVS and the gas station now. You want to enhance the county's tax base. Zoning R1 would allow homes needed, such as patio homes, which are in high demand. Was this land even put out for residential contractors? With this unneeded grocery store, the property values of the numerous homes surrounding it will decline, which is a decline in your county revenue. In Roanoke County, 70 to 85% of the real estate tax base is residential real estate, which is then a primary source of income for the county. What should be of ultimate value in our county is its people and their quality of life. We look to the county to protect us, and we made the decision to purchase our homes because the land was zoned residential and we assumed in good faith it would remain residential. And we hope the county would honor that zoning. Thank you for serving your constituents. Thank you. Next speaker is Rick My Milan. Rick Milan, 4734 Oak Cliff Drive <coughs> in Roanoke, Virginia. Farmington Place Homeowners Association, Oral Comment Part 4. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. <coughs> Should the board approve the rezoning application, we respectfully ask that approval be made contingent on the following conditions. Enforce these conditions through the permitting process by attaching these conditions to the various required permits. Ensure compliance through inspection by county enforcement inspectors during construction and when construction is completed. Use any other legal enforcement mechanisms to ensure establishment and compliance. Number one, building siting. Reverse the location of the grocery store building such that the building is closest to Brambleton Avenue where other commercial buildings are located and the back facing that road rather than the residential area. The front facing north rather than south. If the building is sited at the southwest corner of the property, both, both access drives can remain the same. This is the most effective way to mitigate the noise problem, the most intrusive noise being generated at the back of the building, most likely around the clock. Number two, lower elevation. Drop the elevation of the building and parking lot another 30 feet that is from 1,130 feet down to 1,100 feet to provide a buffer from noise and light for the large number of residences adjacent to the project. The store and its parking lot are already much higher than Old Cave Spring Road. Number three, buffer zone. To buffer from the adverse impacts and to maintain some semblance of this rustic residential area, install a 40-foot landscape buffer of the dense kind surrounding the grocery store building 
and parking lot bordering the residential areas. In addition, an eight-foot wooden fence, not chain link, should be installed between the grocery store building and parking lot and the buffer. Number four, lighting restrictions. Parking lot light pole height and fixture angle and shielding should provide minimum ground illuminance and be installed such that lighting emanating from the fixtures does not shine beyond the paved lot perimeter and be reflected downward from the atmosphere. Lighting attached to the building should also conform to this geographic and illuminance limit. Number five, turn off lights at night. As many lights as possible should be turned off at night. This would include most of the lighting in the parking lot. Only those lights necessary to illuminate access to the store at the rear should be operational. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Next speaker is Susan Lewis. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Susan Lewis, member Farmington Place Homeowners Association, 4812 Cave Spring Lane, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018. Farmington Place Homeowners Association request for conditions continued. Six, limit hours of operation. The Planning Commission's recommendation to limit hours of operation, that is the business hours when the store will be open to the public, will be helpful and is important to implement but this measure will only be partially effective in reducing noise and lighting at night. Grocery stores routinely unload large trucks and restock the shelves between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Number seven, parking lot reduction. If the building is not relocated to the southwest corner of the lot, then eliminate one row of parking at the south and move the building further down south, that is farther away from the adjacent residential area north. Barnett is already requesting more parking spaces than the county requires for this size and type of commercial development. Number eight, traffic study. Since neither VDOT officials nor county officials adequately guided and evaluated the Weatherill traffic study, establish a committee of affected individuals and organizations to identify and provide guidance to an objective third party, not Barnett, Weatherill, or Roanoke County traffic to perform a more typical and inclusive traffic impact evaluation. Conduct during months of typical traffic volume, October or April. Include the intersection of Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane, as well as Farmington Place Court and Cave Spring Lane. Consider school bus and emergency vehicle access. Number nine, traffic management. Apply to VDOT for a traffic light at the intersection of Cave Spring Lane and Old Cave Spring Road. Otherwise, entry onto Old Cave Spring Road from Cave Spring Lane will be virtually impossible without dangerous maneuvers. This includes school buses and emergency vehicles. Number 10, stormwater management facility. An underground stormwater management facility should be specified large enough to prevent an increase in unmanaged stormwater flow into Mudlick Creek, exacerbating flooding onto Farmington Place and adjacent properties down and upstream. According to the Roanoke County Report, Evaluation of Drainage Concerns at Farmington Place, this land's vicinity is at the bottom of a sizable drainage area of, quote, 70 to 80 acres, unquote. At present, even without the grocery store, Mudlick Creek floods onto Farmington Place property up to 30 feet at the east end, as, quote, can be expected during heavy storms, unquote, with current storm activity. After approving the design, the county agrees to inspect the facility during construction and when construction is completed to ensure that the facility conforms to approved specifications. We respectfully refer to the board to our written comment submitted directly to the board that provides our complete reasoning, evidence, and specific details. This written comment submitted to the board supersedes and replaces the comment appearing in the Planning Commission's packet previously conveyed to the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Next speaker is Carol Mickey. Good evening. Uh, this, I'm Carol Mickey, 
member of the Board of Directors of Farmington Place Homeowners Association, 4924 Cave Spring Lane, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board. Farmington Place Homeowners Association respectfully requests that the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors not approve the grocery store rezoning application. The grocery store commercial property violates the future land designations of this land, which specifically residential development is defined by Rona County Comprehensive Plan. The grocery store project required rezoning the forces commercial into otherwise long-standing residential zoned area and would betray residents who purchased their property assuming they could rely on the county to honor and protect the zoning. A residential property would have been built on a proposed grocery store property long ago, but for VDOT properties at Brampton Road and Old Cave Spring Lane needed for ingress, ingress and egress. VDOT refused to sell the land since 1980 until it was purchased by Roanoke County in February 2021. Did the county offer the land for sale for residential developers? The grocery store will increase traffic congestion on Old Cape Spring Lane Cape Road. Despite the proposed remedy measures, which is already at an untenable level, further the grocery store will increase already excessive congestion and speeding problems on Cape Spring Lane. The collector road then will carry most of the traffic from the target customer base north and west designated by Barnett. Traffic studies conducted by Roanoke County Police Department invalidates the weather reel traffic study because it did not study the intersection of Cave Spring Lane and Old Cave Spring Road. In fact, the police study of January 2020 indicates that Cave Spring Lane actually supplied Old Cave Spring Road with two and a half times as much of traffic late afternoon and 68% more traffic overall as McVitie Road. The proposed grocery store will acerbate the substantial congestion at Cave Spring Land in a section now. Moreover, the weather reel study was conducted in February, the severest winter month, a period of at least traffic, again calling into question the effectiveness of the remedy measures. There's no need for this grocery store. Being its commercial diversity, retail opportunities or otherwise, because there's already a grocery store across the street, another three minutes and another eight minutes away, which is actually closer to the designated customer base. This grocery store will substantially reduce the quality of life and therefore the desirable of the surrounding residential properties do the to the perpetual noise, lighting, traffic congestion, and so on, reducing the real estate monetary value of these properties. This presumes increase the tax revenue from a commercial property will offset the reduced property values of the numerous surrounding residential properties. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next speaker is Wayne Weaver. First off, let me say I'm not winking at you. I had eye surgery today, so I had a little, I'm not, I'm not winking at you. Uh, but anyway, I'm Wayne Weaver, Board of Directors of Farmington Place at Cave Spring 4818 Lane. Uh, I was in the material handling business for 43 years. Uh, as being a part of the material handling business, I was a sales engineer. What we did in that part of what I, what I was, to, what I want to bring to the table is, is what I did. Forklifts, backup alarms, requirements by OSHA, everybody knows what that is. It's a federal law for every fork truck to have mm -hmm. some kind of noise beeper when that truck is going in reverse. Uh, these trucks have flashing lights, they have horns, and drivers are required to blow the horns when they're leaving the intersection of an aisle. Uh, the lift truck's horn, uh, excuse me, dock equipment uh, sold a number of these to Kroger Distribution. What they do, it's a metal board. 
it's, it's, it secures the board to the truck. And as the fork truck goes along with its static load, it makes a tremendous noise. Uh, lift trucks going over these boards causing a huge amount of noise. Uh, most tractor trailers, and this is a study we done when they go to a warehouse, have at least 30 pallet loads on a truck. So with that being said, it takes 30 trips into a truck, to the rack, and back into that truck to offload that truck at, at any given time of the day. Uh, conveyors constantly running. Those conveyors are stacking product from the warehouse down on a pallet. These hardly ever stop, and they're running almost the whole time the warehouse is open, opening. My last point of what I would like to say here is that most, and I think it's already been, most of the loading is done after hours. What that means is there's nobody in the store. They can get back the trucks in, offload at night, and that's when you have the most noise, and that noise generates way beyond where it's on premises. So with my point being said, I would like for the county to re rethink about where they would do something with this store in another location. Again, I thank you for listening to each and every one of us, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Mar Moronic. Sharon Moronic. Uh, Sharon Moronic, 4916 Cave Spring Lane. Set that aside. Uh, Barbara Miller. Barbara Meller, 4940 Cave Spring Lane. Um, good evening. Uh, my husband and I bought our house in Cave Spring Lane uh, 27 years ago. We fell in love with the area. Um, our backyard backs up to what the, the lighting and everything that this is going to create, the noise, the lighting. Um, and that's going to be, we, we just love the area because of the wildlife, uh, the wonderful view, um, and to know that we're not going to have that, it's very disappointing. Um, my next concern is the traffic. I have on one side of me four children, and on the other side three. Uh, the traffic on Cave Spring Lane is absolutely horrible. And I cringe when those children cross that road to get to the bus stop. There was one morning I saw a car pass the school bus even with the stop sign out. Um, and of course I didn't get the license plate of the car, um, but I did call and, and, let, and report it. This has been some time ago. But um, it seems like when they come around the curve at Farmington Road, the house on my left is Farmington. On my right, it's still Cave Spring Lane. And it seems like when they come around that curve, they pick up speed to go down to the old Cave Spring Road. I mean, it's just like, for some reason, they like to speed up. So that, that concerns me. So, thank you. Thank you. Ruby, Ruby Weaver. Good evening, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Ruby Weaver. I live at 4818 Cave Spring Lane. I'm a member of the Farmington Place Homeowners Association. Here are my issues. The access to Cave Spring Lane for my driveway during the morning working hours and uh, evening hours. The road is heavily traveled and the day uh, during the day and the evening. There are many days when backing out of my driveway, I stay at the top of my driveway to get clearance so that I can see clearance. I have a very pitched driveway. So in order to get out on Cave Spring Lane, I stay at the top of my driveway and make sure that there's nothing coming one way or the other. Um, there's nowhere for cars to go. If there is an encounter, you're gonna go in a ditch 
or you're gonna go into a framed uh, fence across the street from us. The other issue that I have is getting our mail and our trash cans. You have to really risk your life at some point in time to just to go to the mailbox or bring a trash can up or down. And there have been times when a neighbor of mine that used to live there actually had to jump into the ditch to avoid a car breaking her leg. Um, we've had uh, our mailbox destroyed twice, and we've had several trash receptacles destroyed. We've lived in this area for 23 years. We love it. But to have Enterprise come in and destroy what we have built and lived there for is very disturbing to us. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Kirk Grove. <laughs> Is it possible to pull up the uh, conceptual plan again before I start? Yes, sir. Is that the right one? Yes. Okay. That's close enough. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Kirk Grove, and my wife and I uh, live at 43, 46, 43 Shrewsbury Court, which is an adjoining property to this proposed facility. I want to clear up one misconception before I get started here. Um, they talked about did a cross section through uh, that showed a, a large retaining wall. That is at the highest peak uh, of the land, and this is very steep land. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll see at the loading dock area and the uh, drive through and the dumpsters that the grade back there is roughly the same grade as my adjoining property. So there really is, is a very misconception misleading uh, that cut through that high, the highest spot on the whole site. It is a steep space and all that noise that the noise ordinance would apply to is right adjacent to my property and that Kingston Court neighborhood. Um, but I would like to address with uh, you guys the process and, uh, and I must admit I'm a little naive in the, the rezoning request uh, as being part of the public. Um, I do not know uh, how much uh, interaction the Economic Development Department and the Zoning Department has had with the petitioner and the um, tenant as to other options in the area. Uh, uh, my concern is they, uh, the developer came in and picked this spot, and I have a lot of concerns with that. And they started uh, with the uh, Planning Commission's public meeting in November. Uh, the developer was unwilling to name his client. Uh, second, the request by the petitioner for re rezoning did not include any proffers that showed their willingness to work with the surrounding residential neighborhoods to address their concerns. Uh, third, the request to rezone to C2 does not meet any of the Roanoke County comprehensive plans. Uh, and finally, a comment by one of the Planning Commission board members stating that he, he likes the project because it cleans up the zoning on the existing parcels of the land and the development, developer's rezoning request. Um, it doesn't take a lot of research to determine that the developer's client is probably Publix. And this is where I'm requesting the elected Board of Supervisors in Brenner County to step in and request a thorough review of the big picture for Publix and look beyond the present day rezoning request before approving it. And I offer the following to this request. In reference to the Planning Department's executive summary, the Economic Department Comments reflect a bias as the county is a property owner in the rezoning application. In addition, the economic development states that it will enhance the tax base. This tax base will be offset somewhat due to decreased decrease residential property values, and revenue income taxes will be offset by the loss of revenue at nearby grocery stores. They also state it creates desirable retail shopping opportunities. This is misleading as it does not create any new opportunities just competition. The developer is from North Carolina, and the tenant, which is probably Publix, is headquartered in Vic, Florida. So all the revenue from this project is leaving the area. The use of these parcels per the existing comprehensive plan would encourage local business to build in the transition zones and keep the money in the, in the neighborhood and in the county. The executive summary also states 
notes a statement from the county chief of police that it will result in an increased demand for police services. So however, however, the biggest concern I have is for the future of this area and all of Southwest County, uh, Southwestern Virginia. The petitioner's client is most likely Publix and they are looking to expand into Virginia. My question to the board is, has the economic development and planning departments visited other sites and options? I'm sure Publix is committed to moving into this area, uh, but they have no other facilities in this area, the closest would be in Green, Greensboro and Winston-Salem, which is five stores. Now, while they were building a, a refrigerated and frozen distribution center in Greensboro, that's slated to be open and operational by 2025, uh, they are competing against Kroger, which has a distribution center here in Salem and has at least a dozen stores in the, the immediate area. Um, and my question to you guys, and you are have to be our advocates because we voted for you guys, put you in your positions, and you are my advocates and representatives. So uh, I question, they have chosen this site that has two Kroger stores, a pharmacy and pharmacies, a CVS and Walgreens, all within a mile in a few minutes. Will Publix provide enough of a difference in services to compete with Kroger uh, with their distribution center in this area? And until recently, actually, it was headquartered regional headquarter here. Uh, the Roanoke County is due to its terrain, terrain does not have the capacity for future growth of clientele, especially in Southwest County. This is an issue that this area has dealt with for years and years. So my questions are, what if the business model fails and they abandon moving into Southwest Virginia? Uh, the Southwest County is stuck with a building that may not be able to fill. President Kroger across the street um, came from is from a proposed they bought from Harris Teeter because Harris Teeter's model in this area did not work. Uh, so Ucrops is another example of a failed business model in this area. So have lots of concerns. That. I'm hoping that you guys have are looking toward the future and will work with Publix, whether it's this site or some other site. But but take your time. And let's don't rush it, this process. It's been rushed through on the public, and I'm hoping you guys have spent the time with the petitioner to look at all options in Roanoke County. The other thing is, if this is a rousing success, Mr. Could you please wrap it up? You're yes, already I will. three and a half minutes over. Okay, Kroger's is also so there's three grocery stores in this area. Something's got to give. So you may have a, an empty Publix in the future or an empty Kroger's. So there are other options. Please. Make sure that you guys uh, spend the time and don't rush through this process. And I hope that you do not. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Kenneth Lutlucke. Lucke. Did I come close in pronunciation? It's how we'd like to do that. Chairman and members of the board, thank you very much. I have had my private practice, not Carillion, not Lewis Scale, but an independent practice, something very rare and I think somewhat valuable for the area in Brambleton Commons for the last 11 years. In that time, I've seen the traffic come to a point where I have lost patience. Some of my seniors will no longer come to see me because of trying to get out. And with the current proposed model with a right in, right out on Brambleton, that will make it even harder for us to see our patients. And I'm not alone. I'm one of 18 different businesses in that development, and this will not be helpful for us. It may force me to have to leave the area as well as others in that development because we will not be able to access, as Casey said, our businesses and then the road. Thank you. Thank you sir. The next speaker is uh, Paula Powell. Paula Powell. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Paula Powell, and I live at 5455 Lakedale Road. Um, my business is in Brambleton Commons. The entrance and exit is directly, well, it's gone, directly adjacent, directly below. The driveway that exists there now comes right up against the exit and entrance to our, um, to Brambleton Commons. I've owned this business for 23 years. 
I've watched the community south of 419 on Bramelton Avenue grow exponentially. Residential, business, and, and even a new high school. All the while making the intersection of Brambleton Avenue and Colonial Avenue and Old Cape Spring Road become more dangerous and difficult to navigate. Excuse me. <coughs> it is near impossible to make a left-hand turn out of Brambleton Commons, and exiting to the right depends solely on the mercy of oncoming traffic. With the right on red at Old Cave Spring Road, there is never a break in southbound traffic on Brambleton Avenue. Adding exit traffic from a much adored grocery chain with 200 plus parking spaces will prevent customers that frequent the 18 businesses at Brambleton Commons and beyond ingress and egress. It seems a more thoughtful plan would only allow entrance from Brambleton Avenue and no right on red at Old Cave Spring Road to stop an already overloaded intersection from becoming more dangerous and protecting existing businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Valida Pittman. Um, Chairman Mahoney, members of the Board of Supervisors, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Valida Pittman, and although I have a Roanoke City address, I've been a, a property owner at Brownwood Commons since uh, 1990 and have been um, uh, a business owner in the county since 1985. Those of us who work um, there at Brownwood Commons on a daily basis understand um, that this is a very hazardous situation leaving the property, as, as Paula announced. My remarks are not based on a VDOT study. They come from daily observation of being there and trying to maneuver outside, leave the property, and making a left-turn turn, uh, especially late afternoon. Well, I'd say from 3 o'clock on when um, the schools let out, Hidden Valley High School and Cave Spring Middle School. What we have found uh, to be a remedy, instead of sitting there through at least two cycles of traffic lights, at the intersection of Cave, Cave Spring, um, I mean Old Cave Spring Road and Brownleton Avenue, is that we we'll, we'll take a right-hand turn and then make a U-E to come back. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that is not the best traffic flow situation. So I'm thinking that um, with our exit, our entrance and exit, we have one. The 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 property that's being uh, under consideration is within 30 yards of where our entrance and exit is, which is basically the width of this room. So if I'm having to make a UE to get out of my property, how about the people that are coming out of the grocery store? Are they going to be making UE UEs too to get back to the right? Um, I don't know. It seems like it's just a recipe for disaster. I, 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 I just don't know what to expect when, if that happens. Um, critical to the success of a bricks and mortar business is the ability of customers to access it. Even a single or slight inconvenience could lead to a decline in sales. Customers will shy away from a business that is just too difficult for them to get into and leave. Please take that into your consideration. I don't know what the remedy is. I don't have one, uh, short of not approving the rezoning request. But if you do approve the rezoning request, please give um, some support and protection to your small business owners in the county. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Whitney Smith. Whitney Smith. Well, thank you for having us here tonight working late for us. Um, I want to reiterate what Ms. Pittman had, had just said about the uh, the U-turn. Oh, my gosh. You know, I'm not a statistic. We well, use that old phrase, what lies, dang lies, and statistics. And they're talking about the traffic. The study uh, seems like it's got a lot of flaws in it because I did just the human test and went and st stood down there for about 20 minutes at the bottom of the hill. And there's three car links between when you make come in from Bojangles to make a uh, left hand turn. How in the world there's a lot of traffic going to be going right there? And then when they're not going, like she was just saying, you have right on red coming out of Co Old Cave Spring. And they mentioned that at some point you could take a left off of 221 into the grocery store. 
Now, in real life, forget all the statistics, I can't wait to see that happen, especially at certain times of the day. So uh, I, I wanted to reiterate what she just said there. Uh, of course, on the uh, traffic, everything that they had brought up in the planning commission by our neighborhood, and I forgot to mention, I'm Whitney Smith. Uh, I live on the north side in uh, Kingston Court at 46A6 Kettering. Uh, so I, I've traveled that road. Literally, I added up. I have probably taken that route 10,000 times. I just don't see how that traffic is going to work. And if an 18-wheeler has to leave there, and they can't get out at Old Cape Spring at certain times of day, and then they have to leave the main entrance, and they can't do a U-turn through the church, I guess they're going to have to drive all the way around through uh, Penn Forest and cut through the high school to somehow get back to 419. So I don't think that's going to work very well either. I know everybody's kind of thinking it could be Publix and different stores, but I think the secrecy of not knowing who it is is very important because it could be food line for all I know. And if it's food line, we already have two. I hate for them to be a third unless they're thinking about closing one and doing it there. So I really think that should be disclosed to the public uh, to begin with. And, um, and if anything, I do think this should be tabled a little bit. I'm so happy that Farmington showed up. We have a lot of kids in our neighborhood and parents. It's hard for them to get out at night. But uh, the director of planning, Mr. Thompson, did say uh, after the December 6th meeting that a letter would be sent out to the neighborhood to talk about the meeting for tonight. It never went out. And the minutes from the November 1st meeting have not been posted on the website. So our neighborhoods also had a hard time reading about what happened at that meeting. I think that's very important. Um, and I'd like to reiterate the cannibalization of sales. You know, if you're looking to increase revenue, I just don't see a lot of the South West County people who go to Kroger, get their fuel points, if they stop going to there and go across the street, are we really benefiting sales in our area? I think you really have to weigh that. Uh, whereas we do have the new development out there, well, not new development at a, uh, I can't even think of the name of it off the top of my head, uh, where, where uh, Dunkin' Donuts and all that is, where, where we started years ago. And because of the economy and different things that happened, obviously it's had to delay. But that piece of property right there almost seems like a better fit for a new grocery store, and I, I believe they might have looked at it. Anyway, thank you. I hope you take uh, and I vote no for the store. Thanks. Next speaker is Michelle Davis. I will tell you, um, so Michelle Davis, 4909 Cave Spring Lane. Um, I have moved to the county, having formerly served on Roanoke City Council. It is so good to see you all. Mm. It's much more nerve-wracking being on this side of the desk <laughs> than being on that side. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> recognizing that um, you all have a very difficult job. Um, my family you look and I, familiar. I, I, yeah, that's no. a, your answer. <laughs> Um, but recognizing, um, I know a rezoning is always a difficult request, especially when you have public that are coming out to speak against it. And I'm here with my family this evening. Um, we all live on the property together. We're so thrilled to be in the county. Don't tell the people in the city I said that. But it is a lovely place. And we are on Cave Spring Lane um, and are directly impacted by the traffic backup on Old Cave Spring Road daily. My daughter actually dances at Arvale Stone right around the corner, and getting her to dance class in the evenings is a very difficult proposition as it is. Um, you've already heard the traffic concerns. I don't need to reiterate them for you. I think the fatal flaw of the proposal that you all have received is the fact that Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane intersection have not been studied. The traffic already backs up past that intersection on a regular basis. Looking at the site plan as it was designed, um, it seems to me that anyone who is going anywhere, leaving the parking lot of the proposed grocery store, anywhere but up Bent Mountain, is going to have to use Old Cave Spring Road in order to exit that parking lot. The amount of traffic that that puts on an already over-trafficked road that I know you all have been working for decades <laughs> to try and fix and have not had the support um, from the state in order to try and fix that and the funding from the state to fix that intersection. But the impact that this grocery store will have on that already um, poorly designed intersection is going to be tremendous to the many residents who already live back in that area. Um, I think to speak to the bottom line, many people have brought up the fact that the density of grocery stores in our area is already significant. Um, 
I understand competition. Competition is great. But what happens? You know, the sales tax increase looks really nice on paper, and I love the idea. But what happens when it drives one of the other grocery stores out of business? And that sales tax base decreases, and then you're left at a net zero with an empty building that nobody can lease out for many years. I know a lot of money and work has already gone into this proposal. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room who have worked on this proposal already. But I would ask that at a minimum that the traffic be studied at Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane based on the sheer number of residents that live back there and have to use that intersection every single day. So thank you all. I appreciate your time. Um, final speaker is Shane Dwyer. Shane Dwyer. Good evening, Shane Dwyer, 1314 Trevino Drive. My address is in Roanoke City, but I do live about 100 yards away from the county line there at Holland. So I don't really have a dog in this fight, but you can tell from that uh, concept proposal there's some unique hints that this is a Publix. I just want to voice my support for Publix. I think it's a great company, and I think it would be a great get to have here in the Roanoke Valley. I know myself, I uh, work in Salem. I would go out of the way to stop at Publix on my way home and uh, visit that grocery store because I do appreciate what they have to offer as compared to Kroger and Food Lion and some of the other options. So a lot of folks here do have very valid points. Again, I don't live on that side of town, so I wouldn't have to deal with that traffic. So I understand where they are coming from, but I hope that if this plan does not work, that the county works with the developer to find something else. The Lidl site over next to Kroger at Bonsack, I would welcome very much to be over there. Put me a little bit closer over there as well, but hopefully we can come to a conclusion that makes it work for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I had a speaker that I called out and the speaker didn't show up, so I'll call out again, uh, Sharon Moronic. Okay, going once, going twice, that's it. Those are all the speakers I have signed up. Uh, does the board want to take a break? Do you, you want, want to close. question anybody? You close, close the public hearing. I will close the public hearing. What's the pleasure of the board? It's uh, 8.30. Three, full speed ahead, or you want to break? I'm, I'm going to get, keep going. Keep going. <clears throat> All right. What's the pleasure of the board? Uh, do we want to talk to uh, VDOT? Do we want to act? Yeah, I, I like to have. Mr. VDOT Blevins, the... you are up. <clears throat> he was trying to hide back there. He was I saw trying, him duck down. He was trying to hide. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Brian Blevins. I'm the Salem resident engineer for VDOT. Um, our office was the one that received this, this, um, this uh, concept plan and the study, provided comments, and provided our concurrence. Any questions for me? Mr. Rafter. Yeah. So you, you heard comments from, from this, the, the people that were speaking about Cave Spring Lane and Old Cave Spring, and the intersection wasn't studied. and and I asked the, uh, the, the traffic guy with the petitioner that y'all didn't recommend that that would be impacted. So it's impacted now from what we hear. And by the way, I drive through there all the time. Uh, so sometimes it's backed up, sometimes it's not. I actually had an accident there back in the late, uh, in the late 90s, a snowy day calls that. But Give me some insight on, uh, and, and also, I know we had, we were going to take old McVitty Road one day and expand that to four lanes. So maybe you can kind of tell us about that or, or whatever, widen it. Okay, not four lanes. Um, yeah, the, the, I'll talk about the, the study and the, the recommendations for the number of intersections first. I think one thing to explain, and, and maybe the petitioner wouldn't have been able to explain that, is that at least with a, with a study of this size for what they are anticipating for trips, VDOT really can only require improvements along the frontage of the property, which the frontage of the property only includes a small portion of Old Cave Spring Lane and a small portion of Bramleton Avenue. Um, the number of studies that they did, the number of intersections that they actually studied really was only to look at major impacts at major intersections and for the flow of traffic along the three signals because as they stated there are some operational issues there during the peak hours and on saturdays um, the only reason why the intersection of mcvitty and old cave spring lane was um, was included was simply because the fact that's where most of the cut to traffic from 419 to from hamilton come from 
Um, it was deemed that Old K Spring Lane, while it could have been included, might see a, a slight increase in traffic um, from this grocery store, but the changes there would be minimal, at least for what's coming out and going in, because there's other ways out of that neighborhood. They don't really have to come out that way unless they're going to this area to shop or go to work or something like that. Um, so there was, there was really no reason to include it. Plus, we couldn't have required improvements there anyway. It right. may have just identified an issue that already exists and may not have actually identified anything new. Uh, as for the project, they are correct. We have been working on a project for, at least we had a project on the books for a number of years, decades, I think they said. Um, but and unfortunately, after preliminary engineering and right of way, which we do already own right of way through there, um, we could not obtain the funding, and including partnering with the county and, and multiple different applications in multiple different ways to actually expand and straighten McVitie slightly. And uh, it would have included some of the improvements that the developers do in the day, which includes extending that right turn lane. Mm -hmm. uh, that will improve the operations at the intersection, including the restriping. They're doing some, some minor restriping on the opposite side of the interse intersection, which will also improve some of the operations at the intersection, kind of decreasing the delay at overall. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know your uh, your opinion of their their uh, access and the egress on Brambleton Avenue, real close to an existing business and close to your your traffic light. Uh, what? Apparently, you guys are okay with that. We are. Uh, we, we we deemed it acceptable. Acceptable. We concurred with the study. Um, there will be some folks using that to dr to drop back on to Brambleton to go south, on 221 towards Bent Mountain. Uh, in in general, we do have some access management requirements that they're supposed to follow. Uh, but within this situation, the the uh, pressure that it relieved off of the full access um, off of Old K Spring Lane uh, made it to where it was beneficial for us to approve this and, and allow it to stay where it is. <clears throat> um, the other intersections, while I, I understand they likely do have operational issues uh, during the peak hours, if that development were constructed today, it likely wouldn't get anything more than a right in, right out, similar to what uh, the grocery store is, is uh, proposing. So the, uh, the neighbor that's just west, Brambleton Commons, very familiar with that area and that complex. I've been in and out of it. Uh, myself personally, uh, I always go right and never go left because uh, I don't want to wait there for 20 minutes. So I, I feel their pain. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering. Uh, I, I'll ask the petitioner that about that access out uh, with being so close to right there. But. Uh, uh, And there was, a, there was a question about, well, you're not going to have anything to do with the police report. That's another question. <clears throat> That's all I have. Any other questions to Mr. Blevins? A couple. Um, one of the speakers talked about, uh, from Brambleton Commons, talked about the difficulties of exiting Brambleton Commons and then the impacts of the right turn out from the proposed development. And uh, a concern that had been expressed with the right turn on red from the existing intersection. Due to the possible substantial increase in traffic if this development were approved, would VDOT perhaps go back and look at uh, not allowing right turn on red, or would you think that that would cause more problems in terms of stacking coming out of what I would call the main entrance and exit for the proposed development? Do you, you, you follow where I'm going? Yes. Yeah, I would have to lean a little bit on the, the traffic engineer for the uh, developer to see what they would think for sure, but I can tell you that right turn on reds reduce queues uh, throughout the, the, the cycle of the signal. If you were to stop all the traffic there and not allow that right turn on red, especially if you have plentiful sight distance and no other reason to stop it, you know, because generally that's the only reason why we would not allow right turn on red is because of a sight distance issue, which you don't have there. Uh, it would likely cause the signal to go 
like cause at least that leg to go into an operational issue of F or uh, worse, <laughs> and um, I, and I don't think it would operate acceptably, and, and likely the right turn lane would, would not function the way they, they anticipate in their study. Uh, and if you put a, all the traffic from the development to go right out there only, it definitely wouldn't work, you know, because right now they have the option to go right out on Bramlington or right out there. Um, if you were to stop it, it, it would, they would queue back, I'm, I'm almost positive, during the peak hours. Uh, second question dealing with the, uh, the, the stacking, where if I'm on Colonial and I'm crossing over Brambleton and then I want to make a left turn into the, the project, and we were talking about a 75-foot distance stacking lane, mm -hmm. um, how many cars can I put in 75 feet? Four? It's in general, at least as far as engineers look at it, we we think about 25 feet per car. Uh, car's not 25 feet long, but you have to think about buffer distances and and shy shy distances. And a lot of folks like to give extra space so they can look at their cell phone when they're stopped. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, but it's about three to four cars. Plus, as they stated, it is a back to back turn lane with the left turn lane from Old Key Spring Lane to northbound on on 221. So again, if there was, if there happened to be some reason why they couldn't get out, um, why they couldn't make that left turn across, um, they could stack further into that, that that left turn lane, which it does get some traffic there. But most of the time, if they're going through that intersection, they either want to go straight or they want to go south. Most of the folks that would not go left there, unless they're going to Kroger or 419, which means that they did the cut through for no reason. Yeah. Um, final question: If I'm at the development and I'm exiting on Old Cave Spring, um, how am I going to make a left turn there? I, I would think that that would be fairly dangerous because I have all the traffic coming towards Brambleton, and I have all this other traffic queuing up to make a left turn in. Um, would, would, you see, would you see a realistic option of making a left turn there? Because as one of the speakers said, if I'm making a right turn out only, onto Brambleton, at some point in time, I'm going to go a short distance down Brambleton and do a U-turn, which is probably just as dangerous. Uh, it, it almost seems like if I, if I live further back in Windsor Hills, I'd be making a left turn out of that development. I'm not going to be making a right turn out onto Brambleton. I'm going to be going out on Old Cave Spring Lane. Uh, I, I just I question whether that is that a realistic opportunity? It will be just as much as anything else. I mean, I think you'd have a better distance here that to, to, from where this entrance exists than from where the Kroger entrance exists on Colonial. You know, it's pretty short. You've yeah. got four or five lanes you have to cross. In this situation, you're probably only going to have two, plus you're looking upgrade instead of downgrade. Um, you should be able to see cars making turning movements in there to anticipate what they're doing. Uh, if, if a large enough vehicle, a bus or a truck, you, know, there, you could have limited instances where sight distance could be blocked, in which case they really should wait until they can see or make a right turn out and, and go back to 419 and go around the other well, way. That's a good example because I've, I've made the left turn coming out of Kroger back onto Colonial going the other way. Uh, it's very well exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a well-known intersection, yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Mr. Mr. North. Two questions for you, one unrelated to the transportation issue, but the first one, the transportation issue, uh, I heard about all this stacking. We've got some stacking issues over in the Highlands District. I'm not going to get into them. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, and now that that property is in Mr. Peters' side of the road, he's going to get a few <laughs> phone calls in the future starting bring around Christmas Eve. Bring it on, believe. baby. I'm ready. And he says bring it on, and those people are already real enchanted by the, the experience of putting that one in. Still is a problem. Never going to go away. That's my story on that. The second question unrelated to transportation is, when BNOT owned this property, uh, did y'all ever have anybody approach you about buying the property? I'm sure, yeah, I believe we did. Okay. Yeah, um, right. it, it occasionally comes up. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Any further questions? Yeah, I have questions for the petitioner. <clears throat> <laughs> You're going to be blocked. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, 
I appreciate the, the Farmington Place Homeowner Association coming up and uh, making their oral comments and written comments. Um, uh, part four, did, did they send you any of their comments? Uh, we did receive a letter from the HOA, from, well, received from the planning department. Okay. So they listed, gosh, uh, let's see, six, ten, ten recommendations. <clears throat> Looks like you did a couple of them uh, from their recommendation, but it looks like it's a, it's a big, uh, more expanded list. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but you went from, <clears throat> from one meeting, you went to a 30-foot buffer to a 40-foot buffer buffer. So, I mean, that's, that's quite a bit more shrubbery or trees or whatever that you're putting in there, correct? Correct. All right. Um, and, and the fence, I'd ask you earlier about the material, and I figured, I, I heard a couple speakers say they prefer wood because vinyl is going to look like not too attractive. Wood will <clears throat> will look pretty good. I know it has a little more higher maintenance on it. Uh, I'm not asking you to proffer that, but I'm just I'm, I'm suggesting that might be something. At eight feet, it, feet, it more than likely will be wood. Vinyl fences get a little flimsy at eight feet. Right, right. Um, talked about lighting. Uh, several of them talked about lighting. Mr. North brought up lighting. Uh, I'm in development myself, so I know what a cutoff shield is. <clears throat> But you're at a higher elevation than the Farmington people. <clears throat> so you might have it cut down. But if they're below, they can see under that shield. So you've got to do an extended shield if so they don't, they don't get that glare back from it. Because you're up here, and they're, they're down there. <clears throat> uh, recommendation of turning lights off at night. You know, I'm, I'm sure. You guys want to conserve energy, and you know I, I don't know what your tenant, what the tenant's uh, protocol is for turning off. I mean, if they had 50 lights, would they turn off 25 lights? You know, um, do you have any experience with that? Some centers do that. A lot will keep them on. It becomes it's an issue of public safety overnight. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make it a convenient spot to loiter. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, the stormwater management facility, uh, has the engineer detailed that any on the concept plan? Is it above ground? Is it just a ditch? Is it underground? There's no detail to the concept plan, but our preliminary st studies are leading us to an underground facility, okay. just from a grading standpoint okay. to get the volume. Okay. All right. Uh, there was a mention uh, quite a few times about the uh, adjoining neighbor to the west of you of, of that property called Brambleton Commons. Uh, how would the tenant feel if we only had an entrance in and not an exit going out? How would that impact? I don't think our traffic would function without that right out. It okay. would put too much pressure on the intersection at OK Spring. All right. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? If not, thank you. Thanks. What is the pleasure of the board? Discussion, debate, motion? Well, <clears throat> it's in my district, so I'll, I'll start off. <clears throat> I, I want to kind of relate a story uh, and I am I'm so grateful for uh, all the residents coming out here and giving us uh, their information I, I do want to try to alleviate some fears so in the uh, in the early 90s uh, my wife and I moved back to Roanoke and we moved on Colonial Avenue right behind the Micker Mac and while we were living there, 
Harris Teeter petitioned uh, to get a special use permit, get there. So I, along with all my neighbors that were behind that vacant building, uh, went through the same rezoning planning commission process that all of you have, you've been telling me. Uh, and we, we said the same things. We talked about the same items about traffic uh, backing up to, to where we live and all our driveways that back up off of Colonial Avenue. Uh, yeah, we had a little more traffic, but they improved the intersection for us. Uh, and we were able to get, I mean, we were able to turn out of our driveways left or right. They also improved Colonial Avenue because it had a hill uh, that we had to maneuver going over to that roundabout. So traffic seemed to work itself out uh, in that scenario. After the approval of, of the Harris Teeter in the, uh, in the old Micromac, uh, my family got large and the house got too small uh, and we sold a house about three years after that. We didn't lose any value. There was no drop in valuation uh, in the real estate. So I, I don't think that's going to hurt the, the valuation. I have residents up in Bent Mountain that have a pipeline going through their, through their properties and they're still selling their houses. So across America and our nation, we have homes, residences, residential areas that back up to grocery stores. My own children live in Austin, Texas, and Denver, and both of them are very close to it. I, their houses weren't backed up to it, but several times when I visited them, I was able to walk from their house to those grocery stores. That was sort of convenient, and I know Austin, Texas, and Denver, Colorado, or we're talking cities, and, and that's urban living, but it was available and it didn't hurt the value of those homes. I thought my kids paid too much for those homes where they were, but that's, that's their dad speaking. So, you know, I, I, I cannot alleviate uh, these fears and concerns about traffic. Uh, we have that with all the rezonings that we go through. It, it, it comes up. Uh, and, and I don't know what we can do through the development review process, but I would hope that you know we can look at that and uh, and get some data or, or get some information as we go through that that process. With that with that <coughs> said, uh, well, Mr. I Chairman, I'm ready. Got some comments. There might be. A yeah, I'm comments. sorry, Mr. North. Thank you. Well, I live in the Hollows <coughs> District today. I've lived over here in Southwest County off Buck Mountain Road. Uh, lived in two houses there many years ago when I was a much younger fellow. Used to drive that road when I had an RX-7 sports car. I really loved going around Cave Spring. That, that car was tight on that road, unlike maybe a truck like Mr. Bradford drives today. But, you know, I have saw some accidents at the inter both intersections. And that was back in 1989 um, to 1993. Or actually, 83 to about 93. There's a saying in real estate that location, location, location. And there's a lot of truth to that. <clears throat> I'm usually very supportive of these type of applicants because I know that the revenue generated from the taxes of the land coupled with the sales revenue taxes generates revenue so that we can provide and continue to provide services that are second to none in Roanoke County compared to other parts of the state. However, in my personal opinion from listening to everyone today, uh, this is just too intense uh, of an area for this surrounding residential community, as well as the roadway infrastructure. I think we're trying to put something there that's complex, challenging, and is going to create a lot of complaints from citizens in the future. Our department's going to get many phone calls and have to take a lot of time to address them over and over again. I think, though, 
that we have other better county locations and our economic development people are here, I would like to uh, the applicant to consider those other locations for this grocery store. I also believe that it's an intense area with a lot of commercial grocery stores already. Um, there's been others in the Roanoke County area and city that didn't make it very long after they put thousands and millions of dollars into their site improvements and now they're closed. So I would like to see more housing on this development and I believe that this community in, in the county at large has a growing need for more starter homes for young people but also for retirees and people that want to downsize to patio homes. Uh, they're, they're in high demand all over the county in all areas. So put simply, for these reasons, I probably cannot support this project. Supervisor Hooker. I just have a few comments, and I, um, <clears throat> I too, really um, wanted to support this project, but after hearing to the cit citizens make a difference, and uh, I appreciate you uh, coming tonight and uh, even at the late hour hanging with us while we really, we really process all this information and try to make the right decisions because it's tough. It's a, it's a tough uh, process. But I'm concerned about Brambleton Commons. I'm, I'm concerned about those um, small businesses where, uh, yeah. you know, we're potentially sacrificing one area for another, and I, I, I don't like that. I, uh, I really, I struggle with that. And um, the, there, was a, there was a comment about we don't need another grocery store, and I don't, I understand what you're saying because there are several in that area. Competition's always good. I would say that right there in between, you know, with 0.3 miles in between all of them might be a little, a little close for all of them, but competition is a good thing. Um, my third comment was, Ms. Davis, I thought your commentary, as others mentioned it too, about um, Old Cave Spring Road and Cave Spring Lane, I think you were right on with some of that uh, commentary. It has impacted this. Whether or not it's, uh, you know, on paper supposed to be impacting it, I believe that it, it truly is. Uh, the right in and the right out on Brambleton for this uh, uh, new development potentially, I think is just difficult at best. And uh, for the amount of money that would be invested into this property and to, we want it to be the right thing. We want it to be the right thing uh, with the right infrastructure is what, we're, is what we're really looking for, I believe. I don't think that the residents would drop in value. I don't think that the homes would drop in value. I really don't. I've seen too many times where I was concerned about these kinds of situations and, uh, and uh, we haven't seen it. But that being said, I'm on this bend right now where we have got to be protecting our R1. We have got to be protecting it. We had too much encroachment, too much coming in on them, and um, and so I will not be supporting uh, the petition. Thank you. Um, let me make a couple comments. Comment number one is I, I try to follow what we have, what we as a county have adopted in our comprehensive plan in terms of neighborhood conservation and transition. Um, again, that is a guide, it's not an ordinance, it's not a mandated requirement, but I try to follow that a lot. Uh, my concern about this site is it's a very challenging site, but what we have left in Roanoke County are only challenging sites. All of the easy sites have been developed. We are not like Roanoke City where we have a central business or industrial or commercial core. Uh, I, I use the example of Roanoke County's development. We're like wagon wheels. And if you think of the spokes on a wagon wheel, the spokes are our primary highways, whether they are uh, 460, 460 West, 460 East, whether they're 419, whether they're Route 24. Um, our development runs along those primary roads. And so we have commercial and industrial development along those primary roads. 
but you go one block off that primary road and we have residential neighborhoods. And so every time we have a commercial development, that commercial development could have an impact on that residential development. Um, in my mind, uh, if we can't put a major commercial development on a four-lane divided highway where we have a traffic signal, we can't put commercial development any place in Rowan County. <coughs> uh, we're not talking about putting a large commercial development back off, you know, in, in a rural or <coughs> farming area where you don't have access to the road. This is this is a four-lane divided highway. That's what Brambleton is, and yes. We have residential neighborhoods <coughs> one block off, and I understand that. But I think that's, that's true of almost every one of our developments throughout the county. Um, I understand the argument of do we need another <coughs> grocery store, assuming this is public. I don't know if it's public or not. I've heard the rumors also. Um, I'm not here to discriminate between Publix and Kroger or Harris Teeter or Food Lion. Uh, if you look at our if you look at our rezonings in Roanoke County over the last couple of years, we have been inundated with car washes up and down 419. Uh, we must have the cleanest cars in the whole world. We got so many car washes here. I can't deny a rezoning for a car wash if, if some fool wants to build another car wash and lose his investment. That's his problem, not mine. Uh, likewise with mini warehouses. We got mini warehouses everywhere. Uh, so if another, if another grocery store wants to come in, I wish him luck. Uh, Ucrops went down the tubes. Harris Teeter got bought out. Uh, that's competition. That's capitalism. That's the free market. That's what we live by. That's what we claim we live by. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, I liked what uh, Mr. Scaff and the other members of the Homeowners Association put together for us. It, it was excellent. Mm -hmm. And I think as Mr. Radford pointed out, some, not all, some of the requests uh, have been addressed. Whether it's lighting, whether it's buffer, whether it's opaque fencing, whether it's hours of operation, uh, I think the applicant has uh, attempted to address many of those concerns. Um, I, I, I'm comfortable, if there is a motion to approve, I'm comfortable supporting it. I don't know if there is a motion to approve. Uh, we leave that up to Mr. Radford. But uh, my, my final concern is uh, we, the Board of Supervisors, have some responsibility in this. We decided a couple years ago to acquire the property from VDOT. We knew what that site was like, and we did it intentionally because we hoped or assumed or thought that there would be some kind of new commercial development, whatever it was. And if we decide not to go forward, then we never should have made the decision, whatever it was. Two years, Two years ago, yeah. when we bought the property. Yeah. If there's a mistake, then it was the mistake that this board made when we initially acquired the property from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so, Unless I'll, there were improvements made that's true. prior. Anyway, that's, I'll shut up. I, I would like to make one comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. I've listened to my other board members, and I guess I have to err on the side of what you just said. We, we have seen this all across the county. Mr. North, you know, I, I listened to the comments about uh, West Rulton at 460. But I also see the side of it that the improvements to those intersections would have never taken place, and the improvements we're seeing today would not have taken place if those developments had not we're, you know, we're not added. I, I wonder the same question here. We're, we've heard about the intersection, the, all the problems that are there. Well, once that is developed, and you're right, we, we, we did this land swap or whatever we did through the EDA in hopes that a commercial development would take place there. 
my, my thought process is it'll help that intersection because it'll force us to, to make improvements there as we have in many other, uh, in many other intersections all across the county. So. Well, and, and if we go back and look at history, the 1985 rezoning for Finney, Finney Construction, to build 27 townhouses, that was 1985. And for whatever reason, never happened. the market never supported that. And that has been 37 years. And uh, um, how to say this politically correct. Um, <laughs> Mr. Finney did not build high-end <laughs> residential <laughs> development. He, he, built, he built low to moderate entry-level development. And for whatever reason, Fred Finney was never able to build those townhouses at that site. Mm -hmm. Why? Traffic. Unless, anyway. unless one last comment to answer Mr. Peters' statement. There never has been an improvement one and doesn't plan to be any at West Ruthen Road, period. Through the BDOT study? From the four, BDOT. 460 stuff that we're... B, that don't have a thing to do with West Ruthen Road. It has to do with, with keeping the fluidity of 460 right. moving, just to, just to point that out. Yeah. And this situation, in my mind, lends itself to the same circumstances some five or seven years later down the road. Well, we'll have that debate so when that we'll rezoning see. comes, and, <laughs> and it is coming next year, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Radford, uh, what's, the pleasure of, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Well, I, I, I thank you all for all your, your comments, uh, and it looks like we're going to have a split vote. Uh, so we'll see what happens. <clears throat> uh, I find that the proposed rezoning request while not consistent with the transition or neighborhood conservation future land use designation, it is in conformance with the C2 zone properties along Old Case Spring Road and along the corridor of Bramlington Avenue. It's good zoning practice. I don't think it'll result in substantial detriment to the community. We've, we've kind of talked about the Farmington uh, community. Uh, uh, I therefore move that we approve the rezoning request as it has been requested, removing any existing conditions on each of the 11 parcels which, have, which make up the subject property of the rezoning and subject to following proffered conditions. One, the site shall be developed in substantial conformance with the concept plan prepared by Lumpson Associates, Associates dated August 30th, 2022, and revised November 30th, 22, subject to any changes required during the comprehensive site plan review process. And number two, hours off operation shall be no earlier than 6 a.m. and no later than 12 a.m. each day. We have a motion to approve the ordinance. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Peters, motion to second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? No. Mr. North? No. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Thank you. No hard. Next item on our agenda, citizen comments and communications. I have none. Uh, next item on the agenda is reports and inquiries of board members. Um, Mr. Radford is up first. Uh, yes, sir. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. It turns out that it's necessary. Otherwise, Thank you, Mr. Scaff. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Because two-thirds of the grocery store land is zoned residential, two-thirds of this land has a future land use designation of transition 
and one-third residential conservation, both designations residential, making the grocery store inconsistent with the purpose and intent of the county's adopted comprehensive plan. Three, the surrounding properties are zoned residential. Four, residents bought their homes assuming that the county would honor the zoning and future land use designations. And five, the grocery store will result in substantial detriment to the community, including perpetual noise, nighttime light, traffic congestion and endangerment, reducing quality of life and causing property values to decline. Therefore, rezoning is tantamount to a taking, that is, confiscation of real value by the Roanoke County government. Accordingly, I respectfully propose that the board move to reduce by half the real estate evaluation, that is, assessment or taxable value of houses and buildings located in Farmington Place, Kingston Court, and in the vicinity along K-Spring Lane and Old K-Spring Road, the Jeff Moronic property, and localities beyond that that will be detrimentally affected by the grocery store. Freeze these taxable values for as long as the grocery store is in operation and the land on which it is located is zone C2. And three, place a surcharge on the grocery store's tax bill to compensate for this loss of revenue to the county equal to the revenue lost. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Um, item N on our agenda, reports and inquiries of board members. Uh, the first speaker, the first board member up is Mr. Radford. No comments. Mr. Peters. Um, just a couple. First one I would remember to invite everyone to the Illuminites event. Uh, I know we went out there a few weeks ago. It was a great time. Um, and I have something else. <laughs> well, whatever that was, move on. Um, I, the, the last thing I'd like to tell everybody, I hope everybody has a great Christmas. I want to uh, thank our board for a great year. I want to thank you, Chairman Mahoney, for a great year. Um, you did a great job herding the cats. Um, I want to thank the staff for everything they do for us and all the citizens, or all the employees of Roanoke County for what they do to keep us moving daily and the citizens for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you. Ms. Hooker. Real quickly, I've got a couple of items. I uh, really appreciated a visit that we were um, able to have Delegate uh, Joe McNamara, Mr. Brent Hudson, Dr. Ken Nicely, uh, Chairman Paul Mahoney, and I were able to visit uh, Glen Cove Elementary School recently, and I want to thank them for um, arranging this tour. I've toured it many times before, but it's always good to go and be reminded of the needs there, and, and that certainly happened. Uh, number two, um, I'm pleased with the work this board has done and with the memorandum of understanding uh, that was uh, discussed and voted on today uh, in coming up with a solution uh, for the school board's priority of a CTE center. Uh, we were able to stay inside our current tax base with this funding plan, and that's very important. I'm especially pleased that we're able to think outside the box and put together a package uh, that helps to mitigate uh, the concerns of the elementary schools. Uh, number three, our volunteer fire department. I just want to say thank you to them. They've been driving around a lot of neighborhoods recently uh, with Santa, and, and uh, the kids of all ages have been enjoying that. Uh, I also enjoyed our Illuminites visit and plan to go back again with um, a different set of grandkids, and, and it's just a, a great thing that our, our county is providing. And then the last thing is, you all, I have more champions I'm bringing. Glenver High School volleyball team, state champions. I've already talked to them, and we're making arrangements for them to come and be congratulated. We have not met our maximum. You we have exceeded. No, maximum. we have not. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. North. See what we started? <laughs> uh, no, it's a good thing. Uh, they're just very successful over there in Glenbrook. Uh, attended the Virginia County's conference with several other board members in November 13th through the 15th. Also served as a moderator on the Transportation Forum with Virginia Secretary of Transportation, Chef Miller. The panel discussed a variety of topics such as smart scale, airport, federal and state funding, and rural roads improvements. On November the 17th, attended the Regional Partnership Investor Update downtown. It's been the best year since 2017 regarding $234 million of economic impact as business attraction has been higher than pre-pandemic. 
Just this year alone, we've had 234 economic inquiries in the region, and remote workers have decreased 9% in large part, excuse me, have increased 9% in large part because workers are moving here from northern Virginia, D.C., and the Maryland area, relocating to our region. Meanwhile, we've been named in the top 24 mountain towns in the United States, something to be very proud of. Also, on November 21st, I chaired the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission Legislative Agenda for 2023 General Assembly representatives in our area. Among the many items we shared in our priorities was airport expansion. Delegate Austin, who chairs the Transportation Committee in the House of Delegates and serves as the Vice Chair of the Appropriations Committee, has had discussions with the Governor and has asked for a 10-year strategic benefit analysis for the airport expansion for Governor Yunkin's review and support. The governor stopped after visiting this area on his way back and asked for that request when meeting one-on-one -on -one with Delegate Austin. So far as I know, the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission is working with other entities here in the Valley to put that together. On December 6th, we spoke to the CTB in Richmond at VDOT headquarters on the I-81 widening project between exit 137 and 128. This is supported by the Secretary of Transportation, both this area and the I-64 expansion. The project resolution passed 15 to 0 of, and 1 abstention for smart scale VDOT application. Estimated smart scale cost is around $300 million. This was the first project on the unfunded list of about six projects that were unable to be funded in 2020 in the original, in the original I-81 plan. And, uh, I will tell you this, this was a total team effort, and uh, Dr. Smoot, uh, Delegate Austin, um, the VDOT folks here, Ken King, uh, Brian Blevins, uh, all the regional governments that are putting together resolutions of support so the application can be bolstered from everyone in this area. This was a great accomplishment, and I hope that it doesn't have any bumps in the road, pardon the pun, as it goes forward to improve safety and fluidity along I-81. Interesting enough, the reason this project can't be pursued is it's going to take the southbound, it's going to take the northbound funding and use that to leverage the southbound widening, which is using money wisely to get things done. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, several things. Um, I think we Supervisor North, did you mention the legislative breakfast we had on November 30th? I did not. Um, you can we, we had a legislative breakfast that was put on by the Salem Rono Chamber of Commerce, also the realtors and the home builders, which I thought was great, mm -hmm. bringing those private groups together. But we also had Secretary Slater here, who was talking about workforce development. Exactly. That I think all of us believe meshes in with workforce development through the career and technical education facility in Roanoke County. I think that was important, and it was great having <clears throat> Attorney General Mayaris here. Um, on, on November 18th, I, I was invited to uh, attend a, uh, a, a meeting that Rabbi Kathy Cohen of Temple Emanuel was putting together. Uh, she's concerned about the, 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 the increase in anti-Semitism and prejudice and hate crimes going on around the country, and she wanted to put together a community group to try to anticipate and proactively uh, address those issues. And so I, I'll be looking forward to, to attending some of those meetings with her. Uh, members of Roanoke City Council were there. Other members of uh, the local community were there. Uh, and I think uh, I, I give a lot of credit to Rabbi Cohen uh, beginning that initiative and, and it, uh, I'll try to represent the county well uh, in those endeavors. Um, I, I read in the uh, Roanoke Times the other day about how uh, the city of Roanoke, as part of their legislative program, uh, I thought took a fairly courageous action to try to uh, rescind some of the criminal justice uh, legislation that had been adopted uh, in the previous General Assembly. and. Uh, uh, it came in late today, but uh, Chief Hall, uh, before he retires and gets out of town, uh, Chief Hall was asking that we might include that as part of our legislative program. So I'd like to find out from the board, um, 
is that uh, would we want to support what Roanoke City was supporting? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would we want to tell yeah. Eldon Absolutely. to do that? Absolutely. Yes. I, I'm planning on having a lunch with uh, Mayor Lee sometime this week to try to talk about different areas where Roanoke County and Roanoke City can cooperate together, and I'd like to tell him that, that we would like to add that to our legislative program if that, if that means with your approval. Um, uh, I want to echo what Supervisor Peter said. Um, folks, you got to go to Illuminites. It is fantastic. <laughs> it, we're running out of time. It ends fairly quickly. Uh, my family enjoyed it. Uh, we are going to go out again with all sorts of grandchildren. And, and so uh, it is just a wonderful event. And, and it's, uh, it has worked out so great with our partnership with Center and the Square uh, with respect to the Illuminites. Mm -hmm. Uh, event at, at Explore Park. Finally, happy holidays, everybody. Um, be safe. Hep hope everybody has a happy and joyous holiday season. And with that, Mr. Chair, one comment for you. Uh -oh. I'd like to see a resolution, not resolution for these items you mentioned in January, but between now and then, I don't see anything wrong with your writing a letter since the board seems to be in agreement. Of, of support and get that out to all our local legislators before they go off to Richmond. I know they would appreciate getting that a little early. We can follow up with the resolution later, of course, but uh, I have no objections. I don't think anyone else on the board would have been writing a letter of support. That's we'll right. do. Uh -huh. Thank you. With that, uh, we're adjourned, and I will hand this. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Let me see. Let's see how hard this hair is. I'm Irish. Serious form of skin cancer. Dr. Paul Burton, chief medical officer of Moderna, said the results were promising. It's the first randomized trial.